Yo, if you'd like to support me and this channel, Move University, in creating more video tutorials, then please consider making a financial contribution at my website, MoveUniversity.com. Thank you, and enjoy the video. So in this video, enzyme inhibition, uncompetitive inhibitors. I've yet to actually talk about these. Okay, so same idea, generally. Enzyme plus substrate gives you enzyme substrate complex, which gives you enzyme product. Now, what about an uncompetitive inhibitor? We saw that competitive inhibitors bind at the active site. Non-competitive inhibitors bind somewhere other than the active site. Now, with uncompetitive inhibitors, where exactly do they bind? Well, I'm not exactly sure about that, but what I do know is about what it is they bind to. So the enzyme and substrate have to come together, right? The, the substrate binds the active site and then forms the enzyme substrate complex. Now, the, the uncompetitive inhibitor, IUC, binds only to the enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme, oops, the enzyme substrate complex. It does not bind to free enzyme. It needs, it needs a substrate to have already bound the enzyme. So the uncompetitive inhibitor binds only to the enzyme substrate complex. We saw that competitive inhibitors bind the, the free enzyme and the non-competitive inhibitors can bind the free enzyme or the enzyme substrate complex, but uncompetitive inhibitors require the substrate to have bound the enzyme in order for them to bind. So once the enzyme substrate complex forms, the uncompetitive inhibitor can come in and bind. So I've kind of drawn it here in, in this weird shape so that you can kind of see that, see how it's got this little kind of like indentation right here? Right. The reason I put that there is so that you can imagine that this substrate needs to have bound here, and then the uncompetitive inhibitor can only bind once that you know once it can fit there with the enzyme and substrate. That's at least how I imagined it. Anyway, now that this enzyme substrate inhibitor complex is formed, that cannot progress towards enzyme and product. Okay, so that's kind of the idea with uncompetitive inhibitors as far as the pictures go. Now, how does that look here? Okay, so we just said that the enzyme has to bind the substrate and form the enzyme substrate complex before the uncompetitive inhibitor can come in. So if you just have free enzyme and uncompetitive inhibitor, that's not going to bind to do anything. So once you have that enzyme substrate complex, the inhibitor, the uncompetitive inhibitor can come in and form the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, which, like I said, cannot progress towards the enzyme and product. Okay, so now uh, this this process right here, this uncompetitive inhibitor actually coming in and binding this enzyme substrate complex is pretty important. Why is that? Well, when it does this, it depletes the amount of the enzyme substrate complex, right? And what that does is that that I mean, of course, this is an equilibrium here, right, between the enzyme plus substrate to enzyme substrate complex and backwards. Reaction A there. That's an equilibrium. And what this does, right, what this process does, adding this uncompetitive inhibitor, is it depletes the amount of enzyme substrate complex, which shifts the equilibrium of A's reaction to, to produce more enzyme substrate. So it shifts reaction A's equilibrium towards the enzyme substrate complex, right, towards the right. And what this does is this means that more enzyme and substrate will come together, bind each other to make that enzyme substrate complex, right, to account for that loss. So what this is, what this sort of triggers, is a seemingly higher affinity of this enzyme for the substrate, right? The enzyme and substrate are going to seem to bind more often to form the enzyme substrate complex. So this means that a lower substrate concentration is required to reach the Vmax, which means we have a lower KM, right? Higher affinity, lower KM. Now, the reverse process here is important. So I've drawn this equilibrium arrow going from the enzyme substrate inhibitor complex back up to the enzyme substrate complex. And I want to comment on that because even though this enzyme substrate inhibitor complex can dissociate back into um, the enzyme substrate complex and free uncompetitive inhibitor, there will still be some enzyme substrate inhibitor complex, uncompetitive inhibitor complex, which means that we'll have less reactions catalyzed per unit time 
than we would without that inhibitor, right? So we end up having a decreased Vmax, right? That, that should make sense. Like, even though this enzyme substrate inhibitor complex can dissociate back into enzyme substrate complex, there, there's still going to be some of it around, which is, which is um, taking away from the optimal velocity at which this enzyme substrate complex could convert you know, the substrate into, into product. So the Vmax will, will be decreased. So we'll have a decreased Vmax and a decreased Km. So how would that look on the hyperbolic graph? Well, again, the, the yellow line is the line with no inhibitor, and the pink one is with an uncompetitive inhibitor. So the Vmax with the yellow line is up here, and I've drawn the Vmax of the the pink line to be at um, so the pink Vmax is at 50 as opposed to 100 for the uninhibited reaction, and so the the Vmax decreased by a factor of two, right? It was divided in half, so it decreased by a factor of two, right? 100 divided by two, you get 50. Now. Where's the Km for the for the uninhibited reaction? Well, at the Vmax over 2 in yellow, that would be 100 divided by 2, which is 50. And the Km is out here at half the Vmax. The substrate concentration at half the Vmax is right there. But for the pink one, the Vmax is at 50. So the Vmax over 2 is at 25. And the Km is here. Now, I didn't give values for these substrate concentrations here, but this Km, this original Km going to this Km apparent here, it's also decreasing by a factor of 2. So there's a decrease by a factor of 2 as well. They are both decreasing by the same factor. Now, again, they don't have to decrease by that by a factor of two, they can decrease by another factor, but the point is that the factor by which they do decrease will be equal for both the Vmax and the Km. How does that translate into the Langweaver brick plot? Well now, if we look at this yellow line, uninhibited yellow line, we've got an x-intercept here, x-intercept, we'll call this x-intercept one, and we've got a different x-intercept on the, the uncompetitive inhibitor graph, right? So we'll call that x in it, x intercept 2. And we also change the y intercept here. So here we've got y intercept 1 for the not inhibited, and then for the inhibited one we'll have y intercept 2. So why is this? Well, let's look at the y intercept. y is 1 over the Vmax, or excuse me, the y intercept is 1 over the Vmax. So Vmax decreased Vmax decreased, so we're dividing by a smaller number when it comes to finding that y-intercept. So the y-intercept is larger, which is why we have a higher y-intercept. Right? Okay, so that's that accounts for that. And the x-intercept was initially here, but it shifted out over here to the left. Why is that? Well, we said the Km decreased. So x-intercept is equal to negative 1 over the Km. If the Km decreased, we're dividing also, again, by a smaller number. So the x-intercept is going to be larger in magnitude, which is why it's further out, further away from 0. So that's why, that's why this shift occurred here. Right? Now what you'll notice is that oh, what happened to the slope here, right? The slope. The slope is the Km over the Vmax. So the Km decreased by a factor of 2, according to our, our, other, our hyperbolic sort of graph. And the Vmax also decreased by a factor of 2. And because they're both decreasing and by the same factor, the slope doesn't change. The slope remains unchanged. The slope remains unchanged. It remains the same. So these lines, these lines then are parallel. Right, because they have different intercepts, but they have the same slope, so they are parallel lines. So the inhibited reaction is just shifted um, up on the on the y-intercept and to the left on the x-intercept, 
Um, but the slope of the lines are, are, are identical. Now, my lines aren't perfect, but they do represent parallel lines. Hope that video was helpful. Thank you for watching. Yo, if you found that video helpful, then please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more content. And if you know anybody who might find this video helpful, then please be sure to share it with them. Thank you, and happy studying.